<laughs> That's okay. I'm going to go ahead and use this one versus that one. So um, that way I can move around, and when I move around, I'm not too far from that mic because it's right here. Uh, so I'll talk slow, so hopefully everybody will understand. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask, um, and that's okay. So, um, has anybody seen a talk by me ever before? A couple, not too many. Okay, I asked that because my first slide is about me, so I tell a little bit about me. Not much. Um, so, this is putting legacy to rest with middleware. Um, my name is Adam Culp. You can find me on Twitter at Adam Culp. So if you have any questions or if you want to interact with me, please feel free to use Twitter to ask me <laughs> questions. Um, earlier today, I also tweeted, uh, very early, like 6 a.m., I tweeted out the slides for this presentation. So if you want to follow along in the slides or if you want to look at them later, please look at the, find that tweet and, uh, and I'll tweet it out again. Uh, so, a little bit about me, I, I'm, I'm currently a DevRel at Nexmo. Anybody heard of Nexmo? And Vonage, Vonage or Nexmo? Uh, so, so, I work at, uh, at Nexmo as DevRel, and I'm, I'm a team lead on an extended team. So, I'm creating new things, or my team is creating new things to connect Nexmo with other uh, things like Google and Amazon and lots of other great things. Uh, I'm also an open source contributor, mostly about PHP. I've contributed to Zen Framework, I've contributed to uh, a lot of other open source libraries that you probably, some of you may use regularly, uh, but I've contributed to many of those. I'm also on the PHP FIG. Uh, I'm a voting member on the PHP FIG, so I've uh, helped contribute to a lot of the various uh, standards and, and PSRs that most frameworks are using these days. Uh, I'm also the organizer of SoFlow PHP in South Florida. Uh, so we have a lot of members down there. And I also organize Sunshine PHP, which is a PHP conference in South Florida. And uh, it's in February. So if you're not doing anything in February and you want to get nice and warm, come see us in Miami in February. <laughs> there are worse places to be than uh, you know, in uh, Miami in February. I'm also a long distance ultra runner. Uh, anybody know what ultra running is? So a marathon is 26.2 miles. Ultra means more than. So I run more than 26.2 miles. Uh, my favorite distances are 100 kilometers up to 100 miles. Um, I haven't reached 100 miles yet, so I guess I can't really say that's my favorite, but I, I, I'm trying to get to 100 miles. But I have ran 100K, and I've ran 75 miles, but just haven't got to 100 miles yet. Uh, and I'm also a, a black belt uh, judo instructor. Uh, so when you when you see people advertising for the PHP Ninja because they want to hire the PHP Ninja, that's me. <laughs> um, now the, the one reason I bring up a lot of these things is because I'm a, a very large fan of iteration. I love iteration. Everything that I do pretty much every day is iterative in some way. So it's repeat, repeat, repeat. Whether it's long distance running, I didn't just uh, get off the couch one day and say, I want to go run 100 miles. It takes training. It takes a lot of learning and a lot of practice to get our bodies able to endure that much running. In judo, everybody knows that martial arts is a lifelong study that you, you practice as you, as you uh, evolve. And uh, development, again, that's iterative. It's uh, doing, it, create something, push it, create something, push it, test it, constantly test it. Evading project managers, that's iterative. We get better at it as we practice it. And refactoring as well, which is what this talk centers around, is refactoring. And refactoring is very iterative. It is, it is repetitious, it's doing small little changes, and then testing the change and fixing the code as you need to. So what leads to this? What leads to refactoring? What leads to be needing to modernize an application? And then let's take a look at legacy code. Um, if, so here are some basic questions that I ask people when they're like, well, what is legacy code? How do I know if I have legacy code? And I kind of turn that around a little bit, and I say, instead of trying to figure out if you have legacy code, let's look at it and see what makes legacy code. So generally in PHP, these are the things we look at. Are, is your project or are you coding with some sort of a coding standard? 
Does everybody have a coding standard on your teams, or even even on and code that you do? You have a coding standard. If you don't, you should. Your teams should. That way, your, all your code stays consistent. Uh, but uh, another thing is, are you using object oriented to making the code repeatable, making it so that things can be shared a lot more easily? Are you using Composer in your projects to pull in other code and use the auto loader that Composer brings in? Is your project using a framework? Now, I'm not talking about the framework you made at home. I'm talking about a mainstream framework that hundreds of people have contributed to. Now, I encourage everybody to please create a framework. Everybody should create a framework and then never use it. <laughs> Instead, learn from it, right? Learn from it. Learn from creating your own framework and learn what it takes to create a framework. But please don't use it, especially if somebody's paying you to create code for them. Do not use it because it's going to be impossible for them to, to hire people realistically. So use a large mainstream framework that hundreds of people contributed, contributed to. Hundreds of people are going to create better code than me and more of it better than you. So use code that other people are contributing to. And through that process, it'll be better, and it'll make it so that your employer or the company that's hiring you to create this will have an easier time finding developers in the future. Right? One of your primary jobs as a developer should be to program yourself out of a job. And we do that so that way not only do we get to move on to newer things, maybe better things, but we also make it so that we can take vacation easily. Right? If you are the if you if you program in such a way that you don't make yourself replaceable, how can you take vacation? You can't take time off. How many of you've gotten a situation where you say, "Oh, I can't take vacation because it depends on me." Right? Well, that's because you didn't make yourself replaceable. Make yourself replaceable, but by the same token, that also means that you're promotable. You can't be promoted if the company depends on you, but you can be promoted if you've made yourself replaceable. Uh, but that being said, if you're, if, uh, is your project using a framework is another consideration that I look at. Um, are you using unit testing in your application? Or for that matter, any sort of testing in your application? Uh, does your project avoid, now I used an acronym here, NIH, which is not invented here. And uh, does your project avoid using not invented here stuff, right? And so that means, are you including other people's code in your application, or are you creating all the code, right? So you want to try to avoid it. Now the thing is, is if, if you can answer no to any of these questions, you are creating legacy code in real time. So stop that. Stop creating legacy code in real time. Follow some of the best practices that allow us to make better applications and not invent legacy code as we're going. You know, it's okay to have legacy code that you accumulate over time because your your maybe your code that you're including in has become obsolete and things like that. That's unavoidable. But these are some of the things that you can avoid. Right? These are things that you can adopt and and avoid. So, looking a little bit more at legacy code, I mean, that's kind of, it's kind of fun to look at that and say, yeah, I mean, you're creating legacy code on the fly, but uh, according to Wikipedia, it says that some of the some of the um, some of the definitions of legacy code is no longer supported or manufactured, right? So if you, if you have code that is for some one reason or another is no longer supported, or like PHP, maybe you have, maybe it uses PHP 5.6, that's no longer supported. So now it's legacy code, right? So now you need to go to the newer versions. They also say it's code inserted into modern software for the purposes of maintaining older or previously supported features, right? So it's uh, in that case that you're wrapping it to make it so it works with new code instead of being able to just use it with new code. Or maybe it's supporting older file formats. Now, not all these have to do with PHP, and that's fine. It, 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 this may be other things. Um, they also say that it's code, the code may no, may no longer work without any changes. So if your PHP code can't work without it being changed for you to go to the next version of PHP, Okay, that's one definition of legacy code. And code that no longer runs on a later version of the system or requires a compatibility layer to do it. Okay, so that's why Wikipedia and, and other very smart people have defined what legacy really is okay, on Wikipedia. So now, 
by that token, this is kind of defining legacy code, but what I find most often when I'm talking with developers, the can anybody guess what the number one question that I get from developers is in regards to legacy code and in regards to how to fix old applications? What's the number one question? Anybody? The number one question I get, because I do a lot of consulting around rewriting, or re, re, modernizing, refactoring, the number one question I get is, should I just rewrite it? Should I rewrite my application, right? How many times have we all said, oh, it's time for me to re rewrite that application? Be honest, raise your hands. We've all said it. We've all said it. It's evil. Don't do it. Don't get caught in that trap. And here, I'm going to show you some reasons why. So uh, here, rather, are some reasons why you should rewrite an application. The number one reason is because you're changing technology. If you've decided I'm not going to do this in PHP anymore, I want to do it in JavaScript. If you've decided I want to do it in Python, or vice versa, if you say I want to write it in PHP, it was Python before, it was Ruby before, now I want to do it in PHP. That is a reason to rewrite, right? Because you can't reuse everything. You have to rewrite it. Another thing is if the code is really, really bad, now, in this case, it has to be really bad because I'm a huge proponent of re refactoring and modernizing applications through little bitty steps, right? So for an application to be this bad, it has to be bad. <laughs> um, but use that, with, use that with care. Also, another reason to rewrite is if it is less expensive to rewrite it than to refactor. But don't get caught in the trap, because oftentimes we look at it and say, oh yeah, that's going to be expensive to refactor it. It's a lot easier to rewrite it. It's very easy to get caught in that trap. But if you've analyzed it and you know all the pieces and you say, you know what, it's just going to be a lot less expensive, then yes, by all means, rewrite it. And probably one of the biggest reasons to, uh, to change it, well, I'm sorry, no, I have another one. Uh, there's little or no change in the in or loss in business logic. Another time, a good time to rewrite is if you're not going to lose any business logic. If you have a very complex application, if you have an application that is a million lines of code or five hundred or five million lines of code, chances are you're going to lose a lot of business logic if you rewrite it. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. Always refactor especially with larger applications, always refactor. Do not rewrite that because you will lose business logic and you will be held liable for that, especially in the States. I don't know how it is for anywhere, everywhere else, but in the States, in Europe, you can be held liable for it. So you just don't do it because you're going to lose business logic. You're going to cost that company money. And you don't want to cost them money because then you might find yourself out of a, out of a job if they lose money. So you don't want to do that. And the, the biggest reason I tell people is, when you rewrite, do it because you want a different application. Not because you want the same application, just better or cleaner. Do it because you want a completely different application. I use one company as an example of this. Um, I have other examples, but I use this one because a lot of people kind of know it. Have any, has anybody heard of Basecamp? Okay, Basecamp, when they had version one, and they wanted to modernize it and come out with a new version. Basecamp said, well, you know what? When we want to go from version 1 to version 2, we really don't want to repeat the application. So at that point, they wanted a different application. So when they went to version 2, did anybody notice when they went from version 1 to version 2? They had two versions running at the exact same time. You could choose when you created a brand new account whether you wanted to be on version 1 or whether you wanted to be on version 2 because they were completely separate applications and they were completely different applications. That was, they did that and, and because they wanted to do it that way. They did it because they wanted the new application to work differently than the old application did. It made sense to rewrite it because they wanted it to be different. So, so that's, that's the time to do that. Now, in today's modern applications, when I'm, when I'm consulting with companies, and I consult with very large companies. I've consulted with Apple, I've consulted with Google, I've consulted with uh, Facebook, the New York Stock Exchange, Toyota, 
uh, Royal Caribbean, Disney, a lot of large companies, I've, I've looked at their code. I know there are millions of lines of code. I've worked directly with them. My number one recommendation, if you're going to, if you want to modernize your application, make it API first. API first. Any, has anybody heard of it? Has anybody not heard of API first? Be honest. Raise your hands. Anybody? Ah, oh, you're not being honest with me. Come on. <laughs> I know there's more of you. Um, because I do. I give this talk quite a bit, and at least half the room always raises their hand. So, but that's okay. I won't pressure you. Um, so API first. API first is is where you're creating the application in such a way that all your logic and everything in, is in the API. And then you create an application that then uses the API. So whether it's a mobile application, whether it's a web application, whether it's some third party out there who's using your code, it's a completely separate application from the API. And by creating an API first, you facilitate all of that from having to recreate it. Your logic, your API, your authentication, your verification, all that happens in your API. Your application is just front end. It shouldn't contain any business logic. If your if your applications that are using your API include business logic, then you did it wrong. You should it shouldn't do that. Now that that's not to say that you don't have view logic in your outside application. By all means, have view logic and the way that the application flows, the way that the application functions in the user's hands. But as far as the business goes. That's all in your API. You shouldn't be programming that in your front end or whatever uh, other application you're creating. The nice thing is, is this also enables your teams to work in parallel. You can have one team working on the API. You can have another team working on the web application. You can have another team working on your mobile application. All of them can work at, at the same time because they're not going to trip over each other. They are separate applications, right? And they're all using the API behind the scenes. So it makes it easy. It makes it easier to multi-source these things and do development faster. Also, it reduces the cost of the development apps because each app is not doing business logic. Each of your other apps are just using your business logic and your API in the back end. So it makes it much cheaper to make them. You don't have as many hours of labor to create each of those things. The API already does most of the work for all those other applications. And do it, by doing it this way, you're reusing the business logic over and over again and everything. And it also gives you faster time to market. So that way your company is not losing money, where your salespeople are selling the features, and that's okay, right? Uh, to be honest, how many people have been working on an application and salespeople were already selling the features before you even finished creating them, right? It happens. It happens every day. And you had to rush to get it done because they already sold it to the customer and now the customer is expecting it, right? Well, the thing is, is by doing it this way, you're creating the business logic in the API. Your front end is much faster to get that out. So your salespeople are a lot happier. They're able to sell more to customers and able to make more money for the business. More money for the business means I have a job long, you know, longer and I'm going to be employed there later, right, as the company's making more money. And it also reduces the risk of failure, reduces the risk of failure. Because if your business logic is all in the API, your front end is just view logic. So you have a lot less chance for loss. And hopefully you're using something like OpenAPI for your API and it makes it a lot easier. Anybody using OpenAPI? Open API is ugly, ugly because it's YAML, right? Uh, I don't like YAML. I hate doing YAML, but it's YAML. So you're creating a YAML file, and the thing is, is if you have a code generator, you can feed your YAML in there, and it'll create the front end for you because your YAML tells how the business logic works. It tells how the API works. So it's nice and easy. You can just plug the YAML in and say, okay, generate that for me, and then you go and dress it up, make it fit your styles, make it fit how you want it to be, and you basically got a front-end application of some sort. So use OpenAPI. I like OpenAPI. It's really good. Now, let's talk about some of these methods. I'm talking a lot about modernization, and that's what this talk is generally about, right? It's about modernizing a legacy application using middleware. How many people are using middleware today? Okay, 
Are you using a lot of middleware or are you using just a little bit? Does anybody know why middleware was created? I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it was created, and I think it might shock some of you. You might not realize why it even exists. Now, don't cheat and look at Wikipedia, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but, so first off, let's take, a, let's take a look at three ways to modernizing application. One way is the Big Bang, right? We, we completely, you know, we're going to throw away everything. We complete everything from scratch. So we create it as a Big Bang. We create a, a entire, entirely new application. And we create that in the back end. It's not in production, because we're creating it in the back end. We can't put customers on it. Right? Your old application is continuing to serve customers, meanwhile you're building a new application. And you can't put it out in production until it's 100% done. So typically, some of the benefits of doing it that way is you're starting with a clean slate. Right? This is the nirvana. This is the awesome, the awesome thing that we all have in our mind of creating something very clean from the very beginning. There's a lot of energy and a lot of excitement around doing this because everybody's pumped. They're like, wow, and we're going to have a, the most awesome application we've ever had. There's a lot less business disruption because this application is not in production, right? So there's no disruption in the business because business, excuse me, business is still functioning on the old application. Now, some of the pitfalls of doing it this way is there is constant scope creep. Typically, when, when companies do this, the Big Bang Theory, what they do is they split their development team. They have half of the development team working on the new stuff, and they have half of the development team supporting the old application. Well, the salespeople are still continuing to sell new features. The salespeople are constantly coming with feedback from customers for new things. As they come with new things, what does that do to the new application? It's scope creep, because now the new application has to have that. So not only do you build it in the old application, you also have to build it in the new application. So the new application is constantly changing underneath the developers who are trying to create it. And then you end up with a lot of problems there. Uh, you're also, at this point, maintaining two applications. Again, you have to duplicate the code. Any coding you do, any changes you do, if you do a security or bug fix in the old application, you have to implement that in the new one as well. Right? So there's constantly, everything's Everything's doubled, and that leads to more expenses because now you've got developers working overtime for both of them, and you have the team split up in half, so only half of your team is actually working at any one given time. So it's very costly, very expensive, very time-consuming. The time to get out new features on your applications to keep your business going is much slower. Um, so let's take a look at the second way. The second way is we build a new REST backend. We build a separate application, but we build it as an API. And then, after we build that API, then we go to the legacy application and refactor it to use the API in a little bit at a time. Right? So imagine you have a, mod a modular application. You're using MVC. You've got many modules. Right? You have a user module. So you create a user API. As you finish that user API, you, you tell your legacy application, okay, use that user API, and then you throw away all the code that was there be to begin with, right? And now a certain, that module of your application is using the API, and little by little, your entire application becomes to depend on the REST API, right? So that's the second way we can do it. Now, some of the benefits of doing it that way is it allows us to clean up the business logic and allows us to clean up the code as we go. Another thing is there's shorter time to completion because we're not creating two applications exactly. We're copying the business logic out of the legacy application, dumping it in the API, refactor the legacy application front end to use that new API. So it's a lot faster. It's a lot faster to do it. Some of the pitfalls of that is it takes a lot of front end time or front loading of time because the, your legacy application is already nasty. It's already ugly, right? So you have to clean it up to move it over into the API. So there's a lot of beginning time. So you have to do some cleanup prior to becoming really productive. So, you're, so there, that's one of the pitfalls. And it takes a lot longer time to get to production this way. Not longer than the Big Bang Theory, but you know, longer as just refactoring. 
because now you're, you've got that front loading time to clean things up. And it's also very difficult to do this if you have an old spaghetti application that is really bad. Right? It's a lot harder to do this because you have to clean up everything as you're moving it over and, and, and it's, just not, it's just not pretty. So, so let's take a look now at another way. And yep, I confused myself because I put method number two on this to disregard that top line of the slide. So the, the third way to do things is you create a standalone REST API. Uh, oh no, actually this is this is part of the last one. Okay, so we're creating standalone. These are the steps to do it. So I talked about the, the bad things and the good things about it. This is how we do it. Uh, and what we do is we first create a REST API. We add a module at a time into the REST API. And then after we do that, we refactor the legacy application to use the API as the service layer, right? So we no longer have the service layer. We no longer have the database connections. Instead, we use the REST API as our data connections. The REST API is doing all the data at that point. Um, and then eventually, it becomes API first, and your legacy application is nothing more than a front-end application. Now, the third method is using legacy middleware. Um, I call it legacy middleware. It's basically just a middleware. You're using a middleware that wraps your legacy application. Um, so the way that to do this is you're creating your... Generally, you do it within the same application. I create a, a new application, but I create it within my current application. So it's just a subdirectory of my current application. And I make my document root that. So if you're using Apache or if you're using Nginx, your document root is going to be that. It's not going to be the application. It's going to be this new directory inside the application. It's going to be your document root. And you do it in stages as, as you rewrite things. Um, and yeah, I've got more. So I'm going to talk about the, the, some of the benefits of doing it this way. And then I'm going to tell you how to do it. Uh, some of the benefits is you can update or implement new front ends faster because um, as, you're, as you're creating the new modules in this application, you're creating it within the other application, then it no longer calls to the outside application. Let me think of a better way to say that. Um, I, I, I've not had to say this to non-English speakers, so I know it's going to be confusing. I apologize. Um, so, so when I create that directory inside my new application, it becomes the document root. If it's not able to satisfy the request, then it calls out to the legacy application. Does that make sense? Okay. So, by doing it this way, little by little, we add more into this new application and then it has to call out to the legacy application less and less because it's satisfying all of the requests. Does that make better sense? Okay. Um, so it gets a lot easier, a lot better to do it this way, especially if you have spaghetti code. If you have spaghetti code, it's going to be very difficult to modernize to begin with. But by doing it this way, you're pulling everything into your new application and you're only calling out to the spaghetti code when you need to. Right? Until you replace that spaghetti code, then everything's kept inside this application. There's a lot less business impact this way. The, 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 the nice thing about this is that you're constantly pushing new things to production. You don't have to wait till it's all done. You do it a little bit at a time, and then by the time you're done, your users never even knew what happened. The users of your application didn't even know it happened. It was happening right in front of them the entire time, and they didn't know it because you, they didn't change your application. You didn't change the URLs that they had to go to. They went to the same URLs. They went to the same routes, right? Nothing changed. They might notice it getting a little faster, but that's only if you're lucky. Chances are they don't because they all complain about it being slow anyway. Um, so, the, and the nice thing is, is your it makes it easier for your salespeople to market these new features because it's being created more regularly doing it this way. Some of the drawbacks of doing this is it takes a lot more planning. So instead of instead of being able to do it without thinking it through to begin with, that's a little bit harder this way. You you really have to think ahead of time. You really have to plan. 
You have to know what you're going to do. It takes a little bit longer to do it this way than the other methods. And the reason is because you're not really changing anything. You know, all you're doing is moving it into these new modules and it takes more planning. You really have to be careful how you do it. Uh, overall, you're still creating two applications. You're creating one within the other one. So you're still creating two applications. But at the end of it all, you only have one application and a front-end application. You can take that directory where you created this new application, move it somewhere else, and all you've got left is your front-end application. And they're separate at that point. Um, and uh, this is not API first until the very end. Right? At the very end, then you've got your API and you've got your, your other application left behind. So now to get into some more details of how we do this, the first thing is, is we create a new subdirectory within our application. And that's where we're going to put our new app. Once we've got that in, we create a legacy middleware inside that new application. And that legacy middleware is, we're going to add it before the front. Whenever, if you're using frameworks, right? How many people are using a framework? Like Zen Framework, Symfony, Laravel, doesn't matter which one. Uh, Yi, I don't care which one you're using. All of them have a final, right? All of them have the last thing that happens. Right? Some, of, some of them actually call it final, the final controller, the final service, or whatever the case might be. So you add your legacy middleware to happen before that. Right? Because basically, once an application has hit the final, that means it's not able to satisfy the request. And the final says, sorry, I failed. And it gives, it gives whatever response the failure gives. In this case, though, we're, we're going to put this legacy middleware in front of that and it's going to make one more try. And that one more try is going to call the outside application and say, hey, I wasn't able to satisfy this, can you? Right? Now, it's not handing off to that other application. It's a middleware. right? And a lot of people get in the habit of they create, but when people try to refactor in this way, what they try to do is they have multiple routers. They have one router for the new application, one router for the old application, and maybe some other third router that's from you know, 10 years ago. And with this, you don't have multiple routers. You have one router. This, middle, this legacy, the new application with the legacy middleware, is always serving the response. It, even if it has to call back to the legacy application to get the response, this new application is still providing the response as if it did it. Does that make sense? Okay, so you have one router, and if that, if that application can't satisfy this, the legacy middleware calls to the legacy application in the back end and supplies through the response as if it did it from the very beginning, right? And that's why your users never even know this happens, because as far as they know, they made a request and they got back their response. It never changed for them. Um, and now after we do that, then we fix any routing, or routing issues or includes. Because as you're doing this, you want to make sure that you're covering all the routes, right? Sometimes your old, the old application and the new application, the routes might be slightly different in the way that they're, run, they're you know, uh, created, right? You may, maybe you're using some sort of array way of doing routes before, and now you're using regular expressions. Right, so, so your route is going, you're going to have to accommodate that, your new method of routing. I recommend to everybody, please, try to use, a, in your new router, always try to use regular expression instead of using some other way of routing. Regular expression is just so much easier, it's a lot more customizable. So use something that, that recognizes routes, like fast route. Fast route is a great router. Uh, use something like that. And um, after we've done that, then we up, update the document root, again, like I said, it is going to use this new application instead of going to the old application's public directory. Instead of hitting the front controller in the old application, it's going to hit the new front controller, right? And then uh, the, site, uh, the site just continues working as it used to. There's not really much of a change there. And then we're going to start creating new modules one at a time in this new application. And then the legacy middleware becomes called less and less as your new application has to hit the legacy less and less. You see how that works? This is what we call the strangulation pattern. right? The strangulation pattern of, of modernizing because as you're creating more and more things in your new application, the old application gets strangled off. 
until all of a sudden it's not alive anymore because everything's being done in your new application. And then you can just go through and remove the old application, remove the old endpoints, because you don't need them anymore. They're just not even being used anymore. So let's take a look at middleware. And how does this work? How does middleware work? Well, first off, middleware is kind of like this. It's, it's m multiple layers, right? You have the request coming in. Uh, according to Wikipedia, they call it software glue, right? Because you have a request coming in. As the request is coming in, it hits the outside layer. The outside layer satisfies whatever it's supposed to do. Then it knows what to call next. And then that layer knows what to call next. The next layer knows what to call next. It goes one layer at a time. Now, each layer doesn't know any of the other layers except for what's next. So if you have 10 layers to your application, each of those 10 layers only knows what the next one's supposed to be at any given time. Now, you can also create your middleware so they don't even need to know that. Right? You can have a controller that just handles all that and says, OK, I know the order that I need to call these middleware in, and you can do that. But essentially, your request comes all the way in until you get to the center up, and then the response bubbles out, also hitting all those layers on the way out to gather the response. Um, and there are, so middleware, the term middleware was first used in 1968. In PHP, it's brand news to us, <laughs> right? In PHP, we only started hearing about middleware maybe four or five years ago, but it's been around since 1968. It's, it's almost as old as me, <laughs> but, but we, we haven't used that. In the 80s, it became popular as a way to modernize legacy applications. And here we are in PHP just now thinking about doing this, right? But the other programming languages have been doing this since the 80s. They've been using this middleware approach to, create, to, to modernizing legacy applications. We're just now catching on. And it, it's not because we're not smart. It's just because PHP wasn't to a point where we were, we were able to do that. Right? But modern PHP enables us to take advantage of some of these patterns that have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, so, so that's why I told you earlier you might be a little bit surprised by how long middleware has actually been around and how much has been used because in PHP we're really just starting to see it. But it, it just makes sense. So we've got some, some of the frameworks these days are really using this well. Uh, the, the one that I use most is called Expressive. It's, it's from the Zen Framework team. It's not Zen Framework, it's Expressive. It's its own thing. You can use some Zend modules with it, but you can use other modules from Symfony or anybody else as well. Uh, Slim PHP is another one. Anybody heard of Expressive? Slim PHP? Anybody heard of Slim PHP? Anybody used either of those? They're both awesome. They're amazing. I love both of them. Um, and then, of course, there's others like Laravel and Symfony and, and Zen Framework. They have ways to use middleware as well. Uh, they're not quite. They're not as minimal as Expressive and Slim PHP. I really like using. I, I like using micro frameworks a lot more than a full stack framework. But that's just my preference. Um, it doesn't mean it's wrong to do it any other way. It's just I prefer to use a micro framework. Um, and then, so again, the same thing happens, right? You might have multiple layers here. Where in here you can see the multi layers. I like this image a little bit better because you can see your outer layer is the authentication layer. Then you go into caching. From there you go into doing page generation and things like that. Each layer does its own thing. The nice thing about doing middleware is, let's say you create an application and you had no need for authentication, right? So you created this multi-layered thing, and then two, three years down the line, now you need to include authorization, authentication. With middleware, all you got to do is put it in and tell your tell your, the layer before it, okay, now you need to call authentication. Authentication, you need to call the layer that that one was going to be, to begin with. So it's just adding a layer in, and then you have authentication throughout your entire application. It's not like MVC where you got to really change everything in your service manager and everything else. You're just including a middleware. Now, even in modern MVC applications, you can still use middleware to do the same thing. That's why in, in uh, Laravel and Symfony and Zend and all those, they all have middleware as an option inside them as well. You can happily you know, do that the same way. Matter of fact, in uh, Laravel 5, um, the uh, authentication, putting in user authentication and everything, the Laravel auth, it is a middleware. And that's how, that's how Laravel put it into their new version. <clears throat> So 
So I went back. I want to go forward. Uh, another, another big important part of this is testing. Is everybody doing testing in their applications? Every single application you're doing testing, right? I don't see too many hands. I see some hands, but not too many. And, and that's okay. I understand. We come from a world in PHP where we didn't do a lot of testing in the past. And, but in, in more and more modern applications, as we modernize the applications, as we clean up the code, it becomes easier to test, right? It, it makes it, it just makes sense. And I always tell people, if something makes sense, when should you do it? You should do it first, because it's important. <laughs> uh, so it gets to the point where not only are you testing, then you're testing first, and then you're writing the code to satisfy the test, TDD, Test Driven Development. I encourage everybody to try to get to the point where you can do test-driven development. It is a magical thing, and you're going to love it. Uh, so the thing is, is when it comes to refactoring, you have to have tests. That doesn't mean you have to have unit tests. I did not say unit tests. You have to have tests. It can be just a, it can be an Excel spreadsheet with step one, step two, step three, but it has to be something. You have to have some way of testing. Otherwise, if you refactor, how will you know if you broke something? And you will break things as you refactor. It's part of refactoring is, is breaking, especially if you don't have tests. So you want to make sure you have tests. You want to test at the very beginning. Then you do the refactor. After you do the refactor, you run the test again, and the test should still pass. Because really, in refactoring, you should not be changing code. Or let me, let me rephrase when you're refactoring, you should not be changing functionality. You can change the code all day long, but in refactoring, you're not changing functionality. The functionality before you refactor and the functionality after you refactor should be identical. Otherwise, you're not refactoring, you're adding features, right? You're changing the code, you're adding features. That is not refactoring. Refactoring uh, is, is much different. Refactoring is you're not changing the functionality of the code, you're just changing, you're making it prettier, you're making it better to look at, you're making it flow a lot better. Sometimes maybe even you'll gain some performance improvement, you know, going to a standardized way of doing things. Um, but your tests, for most of the part, should also still pass. You shouldn't have to do too much to them. Now, in the, off, in the chance that you do have some, some other structural changes, then you might need to change your tests. You might need to update them, and then you repeat. Then you repeat. You test again, modernize, refactor some more, and then test again. You know, you just test, refactor, test, refactor. And then hopefully you, you get your application all cleaned up. But testing is very important. You should be doing it. And it doesn't, like, as I said, it doesn't have to be unit tests. Ultimately, you want to get to the point where you have some sort of automated test, whether it's whether it's unit test or functional test. Anybody using B hat? Good, I'm glad to see some B hat users. How many of you don't know what B hat is? Okay, I see a few, some of you don't. If, if you want to learn how to use B hat, I created a video on Beachcast on how to use B hat, it's amazing. Uh, it's one of my most popular videos, I didn't expect it to be. Um, I, I research all my videos before I create them. My videos are free on YouTube, okay? But I, I usually research them ahead of time because I want to see, okay, how are people going to like this? Are people going to need it? So I generally search ahead of time. BHAT was one of those ones that when I researched it, I thought nobody was going to watch it. It's my most popular video. It, it surprised me because according to Google, nobody was searching for it. <laughs> but it, it was different on YouTube, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, it's become one of the most popular videos. Um, and... Um, so yeah, so, so do your testing, do your testing. And, and uh, BHAT is awesome for API testing. So, so typically I do unit testing for all my code and then I do functional testing, especially in an API, because I, I really want to test that. Now you can use functional code in your front end applications as well, but I mostly use it for APIs, because I do a lot of APIs, I love APIs. I live and breathe APIs. All right, so that being said, we've talked about modernize it. We, sh we talked about middleware. Uh, so now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to go out and refactor, use middleware, play with middleware. If you have questions, ask. You know, there's, all, there's always going to be new things, and we can learn together. Let me know. I'm always there to help you if you want to tweet to me or whatever, ask a question. If I can't help you, I'll point you to somebody who can. Um, 
And uh, so a little bit about the, the conclusion. Middleware makes modernizing easier. The rest of the programming world has known this since the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We're just now realizing it, and PHP is to the point where we can start leveraging these good things as well. So, so definitely learn about middleware, learn how to use them. Um, you know, all the modern frameworks have middleware capability in it. Do everything in stages. When you're modernizing, when you're refactoring, do small incremental things. Don't do a big thing. <laughs> do small things, little baby steps, and to get to the end. Don't try to rush it. Take it nice and slow. And, uh, and it'll end up being faster in the long run. If you try doing big changes, you'll be disappointed because it'll take you forever because you'll spend too much time fixing after the things. Test everything and test very often as you're going through. Leverage teamwork. Uh, most of us don't work alone. Most of us have some sort of team, some sort of co-workers. You know, and leverage your co-workers. Talk to your co-workers about the changes you're getting ready to make. Don't be afraid to share. If you have a developer sitting beside you who's also on your team, reach out to them, share with them. Working together makes our jobs much easier and we can become much smarter through asking questions from each other. Don't be intimidated to share with other people. And uh, again, that goes back to making yourself replaceable, right? By communicating with other people, you make yourself more replaceable and you also make it easier to take vacation and easier to be promoted. There's, it's all good. It's all good stuff. And learn how to love iteration. Uh, we're doing a survey, by the way. I, I uh, told some of you this already, but we're doing a survey at Nexmo. Uh, we want to help Japan. We want to do, um, you know, we're, we're really kind of gaining a foothold here in Japan uh, at Nexmo. And so we have a little survey. I'd appreciate it if all of you could go out to, you go to nextmo.dev. We have a Japanese version and an English version. So feel free to use whichever one you want to. It's just a couple questions to help us help Japan and help developers in Japan to do better things. So please take a moment and just go out and do that. I really appreciate it. And uh, my, my friend Alex here is going to be getting the results and he's going to be formulating it so that we can better help uh, people of Japan or developers in Japan. All right, so with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, I have some code out on GitHub at slash Adam Culp. So you can see some code I have out there. I also have code, I have code examples uh, that kind of go along with this talk at slash Beachcast at, on GitHub as well. So I didn't put that in this slide, I probably should. So not just uh, GitHub slash Adam Culp, but also uh, github.com slash Beachcast. Uh, you can find some videos on doing middleware. I have a 14 video series on how to use Expressive. You could easily apply that to Slim PHP for using middleware to modernize legacy applications. Uh, it's a good, a good uh, series of videos. I've gotten good responses from people on it. I also blog at geekyboy.com, and I have a podcast at Run Geek Radio. Uh, again, you can find me on Twitter at Adam Kopp. Uh, and as you can see, the problem is not getting me to talk; it's getting me to shut up <laughs> because I. I just talk way too much. But anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if we have much time for questions, but, uh, but feel free to tweet to me if you have any questions. I'm always available to help in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we have a 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Oh, we do have time for questions. いや、ピアテミです。そう、今日セッション。オッケー。そう。あ、もし日本語であの聞きたいという方がいらっしゃれば、トランスレーションしますんで。あ、thank you so much for the talk and the wise words. Uh just um I got a bit confused when you said no multiple routers, so what's the approach? Oh, yeah. multiple routers. Yeah, so what's the approach you actually what you do in your middleware to talk to the yep. legacy app, basically. So, so with multiple, I say don't have multiple routers because you don't want multiple routers. You don't want you don't want more than one thing to be able to satisfy that route, right? 
Uh, otherwise, it creates confusion, and then may, as a developer, you have to always chase around and say, okay, where is that being served from? If you only have one router, you know where it's being served from. That router is routing things, right? So, so it's important to get to the point where you don't have two routers or more. I've had companies who had four or five routers as we were modernizing the application. The first thing we did is we got it down to one router um, because we, we, I want there to only be one point that is moving things, right? So, so typically what I do is in the new router, I duplicate all the routes from everywhere else. So there is a little bit of duplication. So you want your new router to, the first thing it needs to do is know where to get the other routes and how to satisfy them. Um, then in the legacy middleware, uh, when you create the legacy middleware, it's going to it's going to catch all those routes that are incoming from everything, right? And then the legacy middleware is, is what's going to determine: Am I calling to the legacy middleware and serving up the response that it's giving, or am I going to create the new one? Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, uh, still kind of sure? fuzzy right. on the details so far, yeah. no matter. Uh, let's take a yeah, yeah. Uh, use case. So I have a cell phone app, uh, one app. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. We're really, really sorry about that one. <laughs> no, it's actually work. One was an amazing NBC friend. Yeah. It was, it was cutting edge at the time. It back was, then. It was better than the <laughs> they want. What's that? Back then. <laughs> That's oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then, yeah. That's then you all, all the frameworks of version one were terrible by today's standards. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, oh, but that being said, um, I just recently, I just recently upgraded another application from ZF1 to ZF3, and uh, yeah, so I feel your pain. <laughs> but so let's say so that's a part I really don't get. It's like if you have only one router, all the middleware knows what to call. Yes. Yes. So that's well. The, so the the middleware, which is your new application, it is satisfying all of the requests, all of them, every single one. And then if it's not able to, then it calls the old code and says, okay, can you give me the response? But the but the new application still is always the one giving the response. Uh, so it's calling generally as a controllers kind of thing? Yes, exactly. Oh, exactly. Gotcha. So so you're gonna have those in your legacy middleware, that's basically what it's doing, is it's it's wrapping those controllers in the old application uh -huh. or the old classes if you don't have controllers. Um, you know, it's it's basically wrapping all those and, and reusing those through some sort of reflection, maybe, or something like that. Okay, yes. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, hi. 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 Uh, when, when we write uh, legacy code, so business logic uh, sometimes not clear. Mm -hmm. so. In that case, we didn't we cannot make a unit test code for uh, the right. same time, right? Yeah, usually with legacy code, you're not going to be able to do unit tests. <laughs> um, because it's ugly, it's, it's legacy, right? It's, uh, it's, it's usually pretty terrible. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's generally what happens is that you, you have some old code, and, and that's why you have to just do black box testing, smoke testing, something like that, to, to, and, but make it repeatable, right? Make it, get a good checklist, so that way you know how to do it the same way every single time, and just follow that, until you get to the point where you can do uh, unit tests or something a little bit more automated. Yeah. I see I understand that uh, so uh, we have to uh, brush up the code, application code and you need this code so that's same time. So directly yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's it. So, so you're going to clean up the code a little bit as you go, um, and uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to make it unit testable in your first time, right? But you're, and that's why you do it in small steps. You take a small bit of the code here, put it in a new application. Take another small bit, put it in a new application. Very small steps. Um, 
and, uh, and maybe not even unit tested at that time, right? Uh, maybe after you move everything over, then your next iterations are going to be to clean it up, to get it to a point where you can unit test it. And that way you have units. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Small, small steps. Oh, here we go. Thank you for your time, So, yeah, I'm going to try to speak English. And uh, I have uh, two questions. One question is, uh, that I, I want to ask about the middleware. Yeah, and the middleware looks like a very similar to the aspect-oriented programming, AOP. And uh, I'm also of the AOP library, mm -hmm. uh, if you know. Um, yeah, and, uh, do I understand correctly? And uh, would you mind to clarify the difference of the AOP and the uh, middleware? And the second, yeah, this is the first question. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think you're on the right track. It's similar to that. Um, it's not exact, though. Because um, an aspect oriented, so with aspect oriented, you are basically you're looking at everything. I mean, the reason it's called aspect oriented is because it's based on an aspect, right? Whereas a middleware is not that. Um, aspect oriented is just kind of a twist on MVC, or MVC is a twist on aspect oriented, right? Where you have you have your controllers uh, or your aspects, as the case might be, and and you're using those, but you're still using them in a you're still using them, and you're using them in an object-oriented way, but with a very procedural way of thinking. With middleware, it's different. With middleware, it's layers, right? And and each each layer calls the next layer. It doesn't know what the previous layer even had. The next layer doesn't know what the two layers ahead of it are going to do. It only knows what it's doing. So it's kind of aspect-oriented in that way because it's single purpose, right? It's like each layer does one thing doesn't know what anything else is, it does one thing. It's very stupid as far as the entire application goes. It, it only does that one thing. So, it, but a, a middleware is a little bit more organized. The reason is, is because as you're calling each middleware, you're sending the request, right? So as the request comes in, the request is sent to every single layer. As it goes from layer to layer to layer, it's forwarding the request. Right. And then, and then, Afterwards, then you have the response that has been generated all the way through that. With aspect-oriented, it still needs to know more about the application than just the request, right? right because right. they're because they're not they're not dumb, okay. right? They're they, they know too much about the application and aspect-oriented, much like MVC knows too much about the application. Uh, middleware is doesn't know about the application, doesn't care. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Thank you, man. Yeah, very short. Second question. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, second question is the interceptor or middleware. Uh -huh. and this is the same problem with the interceptor. I, I'm curious about uh, this. And uh, the layer can depend on the layer. Like a can, layer A can depend on the layer B or order. It should not. Just not. It, it should be the isolated and independent. Each layer should be isolated. Now that doesn't mean right. So in order for middleware to work. There has to be a container somewhere. Right. There has to be some sort of container management, uh, service locator, something like this, right? There has to be some place to to store some information. Now that does not mean that your middlewares know about the other middlewares. Right. They just know that I need this information, and does the container have it? Yeah. If the container doesn't have it, it needs to gracefully error out. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't know about anything in the application. It just knows that I need, I need a user to perform my functionality. If there's no user, I can't perform my functionality, go to the next middleware. Right. So let's say, so login middleware can't store the login information no, on the head. No, not. this is not. Because it I found be. some of them and, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the middleware should never store information right. within the middleware. Right. It can store it in the container. Right, right. But it should not store it inside the middleware. All right, thank you very much. And uh, so, so in PHP, we kind of borrowed middleware yeah. from Node.js, right? It was modeled off of Node.js because we didn't have it. We didn't have such a concept in PHP, so, but Node.js did. So if you look at middleware, if you look at the PSRs in, uh, in the PHP fig, uh, most of those are copied from Node uh, because they did, it, they did it pretty well. And I think we've done it better uh, because we tweaked some things that they were having troubles with in the Node community. 
Uh, so PHP's middleware tend to be a lot more cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Node.js now has to go back and refactor some things. Oh, yeah. And they are a little yeah. bit at a time. They're cleaning it up. But it's going to take time. We have the benefit of coming after, right. afterwards. Much like, much like Ruby and some other, some other programming languages are much cleaner than PHP. Because yeah. they had the benefit of learning from right. PHP. We had the benefit of learning from Node.js for middleware. So we won't. <laughs> well, it's not a matter of winning or losing. Everything has its purpose. Yeah, right? Right. I, I like using Node. I like using, yeah. I like using PHP better, right. but that's just because I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, but, uh, but I like Node as well. Right. <laughs> and I like Python. I like Python. That's my favorite. <laughs>